help did you think you needed when you sought psychiatric care? Initially, for me anyway, I didn't actually seek psychiatric care as such. I found myself dumped in a bin. Um, the first time anyway. I just sort of found myself there. I didn't think I actually went out and sought it as such. And I think that's applied pretty much over the last ten years until I came here. When I did actively seek help other than being in a conventional psychiatric hospital. Did you have any sort of specific idea of the sort of help you wanted? Well, I, don't think, I, I didn't particularly want any help. I just wanted to die, I suppose. And then when I didn't die, I suppose I just wanted somebody just to cure me like, in two days of the mess I was in. And, and I suppose it's just sort of getting stuffed in a bin, really. That's definitely the same. You do get dumped in there and stuff like that. I did go and actively asked for help. And I asked for it you know, on several occasions and was given um, antidepressants and so on and had to go back two or three times and insist that this just wasn't doing anything. Um, and my feeling at the time was, you know, OK, so the drugs will keep me quiet and fairly flat for, for the, as long as I take them, but it's doing nothing to alter the mess my life is in. Mm. And, and the feeling very much was, I just want somebody who will do something that will really stop the pain, not just keep it under for a while. Um, and stop the awful waste because I was spending something like 90 percent of my life being so damn miserable and wretched. I was doing nothing. <clears throat> I felt I'd had every sort of help there was in the book, and none of it, all of it, was useless. Drugs, ECT, all of it, outpatient psychotherapy, the lot, and there wasn't anything else left open to me at all. And I couldn't face going through any of that again mm -hmm. ever because I knew it wouldn't do any good. And then when I heard was told about this place, I sort of thought, well, you know, perhaps it's worth giving things one more time, because it's different. It's something that perhaps will actually get to the bottom of it and perhaps help me find out why the hell I am like I am. And actually do something about that so it doesn't keep happening over and over and over again. This film is about the Castle Hospital and its approach to psychiatric care. When the hospital was set up almost 60 years ago, the science of psychiatry was very crude and methods of treating psychiatric disorders even more so. Its founder, Ernest Castle, recognised that outside lunatic asylums, no institutional care was being provided for less severely disturbed people. Castle set up the hospital to meet this need, to treat what he called shell shock in civilian life. The hospital has since then pioneered advances in understanding neurotic disorders and methods of treating them. The present form of treatment aims to incorporate Freudian theory and evolved away from regarding neuroses as a kind of disease towards psychoanalytically oriented therapy. Dr. Tom Main, who is director of the Castle Hospital for more than 20 years, explains the shift of theory. In psychiatry, most of the common conditions like schizophrenia and manic depressive illness, all the various neuroses, they have no evidence that they are things. They are certain kinds of people. And the psychoanalysis is an attempt to understand the person doesn't study diseases. It studies the vagaries inside people, the way in which they run their lives, the mess they make of why they make them, what the guilts, the fears, anxieties, and their origins. The Castle Hospital uses no physical treatment, that is, no psychiatric drugs or ECT. The treatment here has three mainstays, individual psychotherapy sessions, group psychotherapy, and participation in the therapeutic community. The overall aim is to reach a psychoanalytic understanding of a person's problems, and in the time they live in the hospital, nine months to two years, to attempt to resolve these problems permanently. Each patient spends two hours a week with their therapist, who is a trained or training psychoanalyst. In contrast to a full analysis, given on a private outpatient basis over a period of five years, here the therapist aims in the shorter time available to focus specifically on what he identifies as the main causes of the patient's current difficulties. These insights come primarily from what the patient feels free and willing to tell the therapist. And so the success of the therapy depends on the patient both wanting and being able to participate fully in it. What the therapist does is he attempts to provide a confidential and uh, sympathetic setting so that the patient uh, is given the opportunity to express his or her thoughts, feelings, fantasies, images. Uh, in a way that isn't as embarrassing or persecuting as an ordinary outside situation would be. So consequently, the therapist tries to work with the inner world of the patient, with the patient's intrapsychic problems, his inner problems. 
Well, the way I find it is that in sessions, it seems to be talking about sort of very, in a way, sort of theoretical aspects of what's wrong with you, you know, sort of going back into one's past about um, why you could possibly be where you are and have the problems that you do have, which then seem to throw up things which you can put into use in the rest of the place here. And it seems very sort of rather abstract and theoretical at times, and that you couldn't possibly relate it to everyday life. Yes. But in fact, you find here that you can. Because I found when I had outpatient psychotherapy that I didn't do that, that things were, came up in sessions you know, that were obviously relevant to why I've experienced what I have. But because there wasn't any supportive system to back it up, I just sort of forgot about it as soon as I went out the door. <laughs> well, my personal view is certainly that uh, this is the most effective therapy uh, for a selected group of patients, I think. Uh, it, it can't be offered to every patient because some patients would not be able to utilize the the uh, uh, this sort of therapeutic setting. However, uh, the ones who who can utilize, I, I believe that this is the best uh, approach, primarily because it has more lasting effects if one helps the patient to understand what difficulties they're in and uh, how to deal with them. This gives far better results, I believe, than giving them antidepressants or tranquilizers, which will help them tide over the difficulties temporarily, but they'll be back at the same place within a short while. This positive approach to finding the causes of a person's difficulties can offer the way out of a life pattern that's become desperate and hopelessly recurrent. What happened first of all was that um, I think I was fairly aware that I was depressed but I didn't really see it as something that could be treated. I thought it was just a fact of life and then um, I started getting really big eating problems and uh, first, of all, first of all I lost a lot of weight and then I got really obsessed by it and I couldn't think about anything else and I couldn't eat in front of anybody else so I knew I had to have help then and that was when I first went into the other hospital because I got in such a state where I couldn't stay at home I couldn't bear being in the house and I couldn't eat in front of people and I couldn't bear people seeing me and I couldn't get out of the bed eventually and I was just terrified of everything. How did the other treatment make you feel in terms of confidence in getting over the sort of problems that made you go there in the first place? Um, well, I said, when I was actually there I didn't really think much about what I was going to do or how I was going to overcome my problems and I was mainly concerned with trying to pretend they weren't there and taking the drugs made that easy and the whole environment as a hospital meant that I could pretend that I wasn't ever going to have to do anything about my problems and I think I just thought I was going to stay there forever or something and then when I left it was a real shock and I just realised I just couldn't cope at all when I came out and so I just went straight back to the psychiatrist who sent me here is eventually. That, is that the sort of attitude of being you can't have here that you can just be complacent about? Um, I think it is possible to be complacent here but I wasn't, I don't think I've ever been because I think basically I always have wanted to do something about myself but until I came here there didn't seem to be any feasible way of doing anything about myself and there didn't seem to be anybody to talk about the problems with and I knew that that was the only way I could really hope to solve anything. The castle was early to recognise then in an institution aiming to treat people, the aim must be pursued not just in formal therapy sessions, but in the patient's everyday life. What arose out of this recognition was the concept of a therapeutic community. The first thing that happened at the Castle Hospital was uh, a study of the staff-patient relations. Uh, we had a look at the medical model where patients are treated with charity and discipline and we felt this is no way to treat people. Um, this is, we felt that we had somehow to establish a system of 
mutual respect in which the patients were seen to be people like the staff but this was very difficult because the staff had entrenched attitudes uh, they were split among themselves in a funny kind of hierarchical system certain people didn't speak together or eat and dine in the same room together and all this had to be looked at by various discussions I, uh, and you can't just tell people they've got to eat together you know you can't do it that way so the thing began with lots of staff discussions about what they wanted from each other and various proposals were made and rejected and so few were accepted but the staff began to meet together to think about each other's problems and what they were doing with patients. And when that got reasonably well sorted out, then their attitude to patients a bit altered a bit, and we began then to offer patients in hospital roles of responsibility and patient participation in ordering the whole community. The various rules that were made in the hospital were made by staff and patients together to make sense of the situation. Um, you see, the discipline of um, staff telling patients what to do is on the assumption that staff know best. And in fact, staff don't always know best. It had to be a discipline of common sense. This is the essence of a therapeutic community. The community has evolved on the principle that an environment does not become therapeutic merely by goodwill, but has to be deliberately created. The way the hospital is organised reflects this, aiming to make all the community members, doctors, nurses, patients and administrators, conscious that they share responsibility for how the community is running. We spent a lot of time talking here and we try and promote an atmosphere where people can share honestly their feelings, both their caring, helpful feelings and their critical, not such pleasant feelings. And really that needs people to know each other and respect and trust each other quite a lot. But also means that people have a chance to find out much more about themselves and their relationships with other people if there's this kind of spirit of exchange and honesty going on. One of the ways uh, we endeavour to uh, make the community therapeutic is by, um, by offering our patients an opportunity to enter into meaningful therapeutic work with, with us. Uh, and this can extend from um, caring and running a playgroup on the family's unit uh, to being up during the night supporting and caring for a patient who feels extremely distressed. Um, what we're in fact offering the patients is an opportunity to um, use their energies uh, in a positive way to help themselves and to help the people rather than passively uh, accept treatment. An important way of making the patients feel actively involved is expressed in the large amount of responsibility they bear for the running of the hospital. A major task is the planning and preparation of the evening meal for the 60 or so patients living here. Patients do a lot of the cleaning in the hospital. They also run the playgroup, organise the laundry, and help decide what furniture is bought, how the rooms are decorated, and how the budget is spent. Through discussions with doctors and nurses, patients are involved in decisions relating to the admission of new patients, assessment, and leaving dates. At night, when the staff go home, the patients assume much of the care and support of other patients, more traditionally taken over by night nursing staff. I would say that the, the main way in which decisions are arrived at here is through uh, as wide a discussion as possible taking place between staff and patient groups so that the decision-making process is spread widely through the whole hospital. Uh, we uh, believe that it's only possible to make decisions if you have adequate information and that, that information dissemination is carried out mainly through the use of groups, group discussions between staff, between staff and patients and sometimes just between patients themselves. The hospital is divided into three units. The therapists, nurses and patients on each unit meet every morning. These meetings partly deal with administrative matters, but further attempt to confront and resolve any tensions and difficulties that staff and patients are facing. They provide a daily review of incidents at the hospital and the means whereby the unit can remain responsive to the feelings of its members. Psychotherapy is also conducted in smaller groups which aim to confront more specific problems which patients have in common. For example, the adolescence group, the mother's group, and the phobic group. In our firm, we have a group we call phobic group, 
which we've developed specifically to try to uh, increase the efficiency of our treatment of phobic avoidance problems. And by phobic avoidance, I mean uh, all sorts of behavior that uh, really amounts to avoiding particular aspects of life or experience because of fear uh, or anticipated fear. We certainly think that um, the success of uh, uh, this way of treating phobias, uh, um, especially, especially social phobias, is, is very much more effective when you have uh, it uh, becoming a group matter and a group concern. The uh, degree to which individuals uh, who have uh, large avoidance problems uh, have built those into their way of life is very great and often people come into hospital uh, who, who avoid really major aspects of an ordinary life um, is hard to appreciate until one actually lives with them and those who live closest with them and those who have the most experience of, of it because they do the same things themselves are very frequently those who can be most helpful in uh, ferreting out and, uh, and putting pressure on other individuals. There's no doubt it's a pressure group though and uh, involves not not force as such, but certainly pretty forcible persuasion at times. Again, we find that a group can forcibly persuade much more accurately and uh, kindly than, uh, say, an individual, especially an individual therapist who may not have ever had any experience of that trouble himself. For patients entering the hospital, the way the community works can be baffling at first, and it may take some time to understand and appreciate the therapeutic approach. Actually deciding to be admitted to a hospital was an enormous step and a sort of enormous admission of failure. And having taken that step, I somehow felt that someone was going to take over and make everything all right, suddenly. And, you know, after a few days it was obvious that that wasn't the way it was happening. And that the same problems that I was confronting outside were, were all still here, intensified, if anything. Um, and I felt just as depressed and just as insecure and just as frightened um, and it felt awful sort of hopeless you know I finally took the step of coming here and, and nothing's changed did that impression change I mean, did you yeah. feel you had more idea what was going on as mm. after you know sort of a few weeks I realized that there were all the opportunities in the world for me to make the changes and all the support in the world and uh, the whole thing looked quite different, but my first feeling was despair. Did anyone agree with I think that the, the way things change was so important, because um, when, when I came, it seemed quite like, I mean, I had lived at boarding school, but it seemed quite like just another place to live with meetings you had to go to, and it seemed uh, it took a long time to sort out that I was there to do it for myself, you know. Um, so it is very carry hard on. to see, actually, how, it, how you can use the place. <coughs> I can remember people talking about using the place, and I just didn't know what they were talking about. I couldn't see how you were supposed to do it, and waiting for somebody to come along and pat me on the back. Yeah, they don't. That's the But you do thing. think, don't you, that you're going to be told what to do, and do this, and you'll be all all right, and yeah. it'll all be made better. And in fact, you only sort of realise after months and months that you have to figure out the things that you ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see how the community can be supporting at first, I don't. I thought it was just all going to happen in the sessions, sort of individual sessions. I don't think it's going to happen in anything to do with other people particularly at all. So I think it is when you get to know people mm. really mm. and you start talking with other people about that. And it's yeah, because I think the structure of this place, like, sort of, it's set up without any rigid structures. Mm. When you first come in you do feel really alone mm. because you don't know anybody and there doesn't seem to be anywhere to go and nobody's telling you where to go or what to do. I think you just sit there and you do feel really alone for the first couple of weeks. But I think also, I mean, it's getting used to the idea that you, that people do sit around and talk about themselves at a very personal level mm. and that you can do this and feeling safe to do that. Yeah, to begin with, and it's pretty big strain. Yeah. I mean, you can't do it at first at yeah. all because you think, well, I can do that in sessions. Mm. But how on earth can I do this in a group of 16 people? Mm. Especially yeah. when the group of 16 people have been established for a while and they know each mm, other's problems right. and they don't know yours. But well, you're um, not sure at first how you can use the community to get support. Mm. No. There is this um, amazing feeling of um, other people having gone through what you've 
gone through. And I think that's the revelation that, that hit me when I first came in, was I couldn't believe that I wasn't um, a freak or a zombie and different from everybody else. Because just talking about it, you find out. But it's part of it, isn't it? The oh, fact that you realize other people have gone through exactly the same as you have. And um, I, I think, think that's things. what makes it hard to begin with, because you don't believe believe that to begin with because everybody knows their way around and knows how the hospital works administratively and as well as in the treatment. And people are really sort of together and not screaming and running around the corridors and things and I think you sort of think that you're much thicker than everybody yeah. else. Yeah, oh yeah. And that yeah. you'll never fit in. Mm. Did you find it strange having so much free time of your own to, to do what you wanted to do in without people telling you, well, this is what you're supposed to do at this time, and this is what you're supposed to do at that time. Mm. No, I don't think so. Because I mean, if you're in an ordinary bin, you're just left on your own all day long, virtually. So, I mean, it's quite usual to be sitting around with nobody structuring it, your time for you, but it's just that it's different here. It's pressure um, that people are asking you to, to do, 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 do things. To do them yeah. for yourself. Yeah. You know, um, and in that time. And also in a normal hospital, you're usually with other people, like in a ward or somewhere, and you're in your room more or less when you first come and that can feel really isolating because you're sharing a room with one other person who you don't know very well or two other people and you can feel really sort of isolated because they know each other and you don't know them but that's where it comes into it's up to you because i mean mm -hmm. you've got to go out of the room mm -hmm. and do things you've got to go and talk to people you've got to make yourself say go out to the shops or whatever it is or anything you've got to go and find other people mm -hmm. you can't always expect people to come and you find you that the family itself can remain fairly isolated mm. um, and not get much benefit from the other members of the community. Um, and it, but it has to be a two-way thing. You know, the unit Absolutely. always makes an effort for new people, yeah. but you can't uh, build something on absolutely nothing. No. There must be a response from the, the new individual. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Do you feel any pressure from knowing that it's a sort of a short-term stay mm -hmm. here, and that you've got sort of a certain amount of time to be here? Is that something you're aware of? Most of the time, I think. But it comes in bursts, doesn't it? You oh, settle yeah. into a yes. sort of rut, mm -hmm. you know, and get very comfortable. Mm. And then you suddenly, people leave, or, or you're suddenly reminded of the passage of time and that you may only have a short while left. And it's remarkable how much of a spurt people put on when mm. they get a leaving date, which is usually six to eight weeks in advance. And how much change seems to come about in that time. That's, I think it takes a long time to get any understanding of what you're trying to achieve here. Mm -hmm. That I remember when I first came in, I wanted to get back to sort of normal life, to be able to cope with um, mm -hmm. doing everyday things, which was really quick, really easy, you know. And after I did that, I thought, now what? Which is the most difficult part, um, thinking about all the um, the problems that, that were so obscured by all the depression and everything. Um, took ages. I mean, I'm still discovering now, after seven months, what, what I'm doing here. The work of creating a therapeutic community extends to ensuring in informal ways that relationships among the staff and between staff and patients are open and non-authoritarian. Much of the responsibility for this informal work rests with the nurses here, for they work most closely with patients on a day-to-day -day basis and can be responsive to rifts and tensions which emerge in the community. In general, though, there is an ease and informality in the atmosphere of the hospital which is particularly apparent at mealtimes, shared by staff and patients. In staff work, the CASA aims to avoid traditional hierarchies and rather to approach therapeutic work cooperatively as a staff team. Therapists and nurses liaise regularly to share the insights their different jobs provide. Such rituals as staff coffee time every morning are seen as important in fostering the amount of communication and cooperation between the staff. There is here, exceptionally, full recognition given to the importance of the nurse's role within a therapeutic community. There are certain things I think that would be well worth considering by other institutions. One is the very great emphasis put on nursing skills at the Castle Hospital. The responsibility is given to nurses to make their own decisions uh, rather than having to turn to authority for permission to do this or that. In turn, the nurses treat their patients in this way. Help the patient to make their own decisions. And the, um, I think that the, the weight for our nurse training is a very important thing, well worthy of uh, emulation, I think. Could you say what you regard as the major task of the nurses at the castle? Yes, I, I think the main job is to make a relationship with the patients, individually and 
in groups and to be available to do things, to get to know each other and as well as that to think about it afterwards with colleagues or in seminar situations. So it's more than an ordinary sort of sociable relationship because I mean nurses do work quite closely with patients but it has to be in a professional way. I mean it has to be about the therapeutic aims of the whole place. But it does involve the nurse with much more of her whole self really. Her own interests, her own particular personality comes into it very much. How would you describe the relationship you have with your nurse? Um, I think Claire's a really good nurse and um, I see her once a week for a long talk and that tends to be different from the talks I have with my doctor. Um, she talks more on a practical level of what I can do about my problems and how she can help me. Um, uh, she talks to me very much as an equal rather than as a nurse. And we get on really well. Have you experienced nursing care in other institutions? It's very different indeed. Um, in the last mental hospital I was in, uh, the kind of care the nurses gave there was very much as a nurse who was to look after me, to make sure my bed was made up and that I was dressed. And they really didn't have very much at all to do with me as a person or what was going on inside me. We think this is very important that, that people have real tasks to do together and not contrived ones. So all the housekeeping and ordinary maintenance of the place, cooking and shopping and washing, are the sort of things that patients have responsibilities for and nurses work with them about. And it, these are areas where people's difficulties show up quite clearly sometimes. So it's certainly a very fruitful way of working, of having first-hand contact with the sort of difficulties patients are so often finding in their everyday lives. She's very supportive to things I want to do, whether that's if I want to try and go out on a bus somewhere where I haven't been and I want her help in that, or whether it's talking about a relationship I'm involved in, or whether it's talking about going home and what that involves. Because I'm not in the same kind of emotional binds with her that I am with other patients here. I think that allows for her to be able to see more clearly what's going on and to give me a different view of what I'm doing and the way I'm living. A lot of the reason why I can take it from Claire is because I respect her as a person, the way she is honest and open with me. The Castle Hospital is well known as a leader in the theory and practice of family psychiatry. It remains the only hospital in Britain to accept whole families into a therapeutic community. There are usually five to ten such families here, and they form one of the units in the hospital, Ross Firm. The development of the family unit is a good illustration of the way theoretical advances made here arise out of the practical experiences of community members. Could you outline the evolution of Ross as a family unit? Well, as you know, the hospital began by treating single adult patients. And it came to a point where one mother couldn't come into hospital unless she brought her child with her. And agreeing to do that led to an understanding of such benefits of associating mother and children who went on to treating mother and babies in hospital together. And then, in order not to split up the family, we started admitting husbands as well. And for a time, we had husbands as if healthy adults lodged. Then we went on, as in many other institutions, to look at the whole family and realize how much more we could do for individuals by knowing something about the whole family. And it's well known from, for example, trying to treat children that any change or improvement in children uh, can't be established beyond what the parents can also go along with. And therefore, in admitting the whole family, we make it possible for the whole family to adapt and to stabilize the change. 
a young mother with a new baby might find her feelings, which surprise her as much as anyone else, of hostility towards the child, make it very difficult for her to go on being with her husband and to tolerate being alone. What we find is that um, these families of closed family systems in isolation, when they come into hospital and begin to mix with other families in the hospital, this begins to, in a uh, intermingling way, open up the families to each other and also their families, through ex their problems through experiencing each other. How do you find having treatment with your husband and child living in the community with you? It's absolutely tremendous. I couldn't imagine anything working as well under any other circumstances. Um, because it's, it's totally different from taking a patient away from the normal environment, isolating him for a short period, um, and then returning them to the environment. Here, there's the sort of changes that one can try and achieve are done in the context of normal family existence. Do you find um, it's a strain as well, having a family with you, on, on the sort of family relationship? Um, no, I... It's helped the relationship enormously. I mean, certainly the relationship with my husband. Um, and it, it's, it's certainly helped me to understand what's going on um, with Russell and me as he's getting older and, and sort of more demanding. Um, I think it's, it, it's made things better all around. Well, sometimes I go straight to a session fresh from problems of trying to find someone to look after Russell and, and you know, all the hassle there is involved in that and all the feelings uh, you have about um, coping with a small child and, and the way you sometimes feel trapped and restricted are all sort of fresh and very real. And the feelings of guilt about resenting him sometimes, all those things are here very fresh, you know. In most mental hospitals, patients are still regarded as people with some kind of identifiable mental illness, and it is this illness that has to be treated. It is consistent with this approach that physical treatments such as drugs and ECT are employed. The therapy employed at the castle rests on a rejection of this medical model. Patients are not seen as set people, but as people whose anxieties and painful problems arise from complex and often obscure events in their life. Treatment proceeds by making these people aware of such causes encouraging them to accept responsibility for the resolution of them. Many patients at the castle have spent time in traditional mental hospitals and feel that the approach there has done little to resolve their difficulties. In the light of this, the prevalent unquestioning acceptance of the medical model is disturbing. Little attention has been paid to experimental hospitals like the castle. It is sad and ironic that in this way the castle still performs its original function and then it remains one of the few places where people who need psychiatric help and some period of institutional care can go as an alternative to a traditional mental hospital. Where would you be if you weren't here now? Um, well, either in another bin or dead, I think. Where do you think you'd be if you weren't at, at the castle? I don't know. I really don't. Probably in another bin, I should think. <laughs> Having ECT or being on full drugs again, I should think, most likely. Where do, where do you think you'd be if you weren't here? Probably surviving in the community um, at a very minimal level. I would guess diving off to the GP for antidepressants of some kind very often. And uh, probably not getting very far. 